This movement of the fingers, easy for humans, is a task of incredible complexity for robots. NASA scientists are devoting thousands of man-hours to developing robots capable of working alongside human beings on other planets, getting them to do things like bolting together sections of buildings. Experts say that it may be a case of designing different robots for different tasks, physical specialization for jobs like drilling or climbing buildings. Developing practical working robots means inventing new ways of doing things. These are robot muscles made of plastic that are strong and light. Getting robots to complete delicate tasks is more of a challenge than heavy work. Plastic muscles may be the solution. There's another challenge too, making humans and robots work together in the most productive way. Humans and robots have different capabilities. Repetitive tasks are suitable for robots. Humans are best at management. But what do we do when the robots become too human? This is my dream. This is the place where robots meet. Look, you can see them here as slaves to logic. And this man on the hill comes to free them. Do you know who he is? The man in the dream is you. America's first long-term presence in space. But scientists discovered that astronauts lose bone mass during long flights at a rate of 1% a month. The challenge is to discover a countermeasure that is, a method of preventing accelerated bone loss seen in astronauts on long duration flights. On Earth, the same research would take 10 years, while the data would be nowhere near as useful. There's no doubt that the research findings could result in a treatment or cure for osteoporosis much sooner and help us better understand normal bone loss due to aging. By age 70, we've all lost 35% of our skeleton. During the first three to five years after menopause, women will lose an additional two to four percent a year. Studying bone loss in space will greatly enhance our knowledge base back here on Earth. When NASA's artists imagined what the International Space Station would look like someday, their space scientists already knew how important it would be to use it to study bone density. Results of the study would help develop countermeasures for astronauts' eventual return to Earth and to prepare for human exploration and perhaps even colonization of other planets. How much bone loss can occur in the absence of gravity before irreversible damage is done? What exercises and dietary changes can retard or prevent bone loss? And what could retard or prevent bone loss and what medications might help encourage new growth? These are questions to be answered by conducting extended stay research on board the International Space Station. Since the first humans appeared on Earth, the Sun and the planets have been a constant source of mystery, a puzzle that people have tried to solve for centuries. When the space age dawned, we sent spacecraft to the planets nearest to our own, Mercury, Mars, and Venus, and we were able to look back at our own planet. The Pioneer and the Voyager spacecraft were the first to venture out into the outer solar system with its bizarre and hidden worlds. The voyagers sent back these startling images of the violent storm that is Jupiter's great red spot. Their next stop was Saturn, where the majestic rings were revealed in surprising detail. The two spacecraft then parted company as Voyager 1 started its journey into interstellar space, and Voyager 2 traveled on towards Uranus. 
Voyager's success in finding the unexpected continued as it revealed the mysteries of this strange tipped over world and its complex moon, Miranda. But Voyager's tour still had one last stop, Neptune. There, it sent back images of the tumultuous great dark spot and measured the fastest winds in the solar system before traveling to its large moon, Triton, witnessing enormous geyser-like plumes on the cold south polar cap. Voyager 2 saw Neptune up close, but Voyager 1 also saw Neptune from a vantage point that no spacecraft ever had before. High above the plane where the planets orbit the sun, Voyager 1 turned and looked home. There were the planets captured as small points of light against the vast blackness of space. The discoveries of Voyager were more than anyone could have hoped for or predict. Voyager leaves us with a legacy that will continue to fire the imagination for generations to come. Designing and planning spacecraft and missions generates many side benefits of knowledge, information and tools. The key to the success of space research is computer modelling. The ability to evaluate a number of factors before committing to a particular configuration. Engineers have also been using these same modelling techniques to improve the design and durability of artificial joints. Joint replacement surgery is performed almost every day at most major hospitals. Here, an orthopaedic surgeon shows a widely used artificial knee. The problem is that implants like these have to be replaced every 10 to 15 years. Space researchers are using their computer codes to come up with a design that will stay securely in the bone for a longer period of time. These techniques also make it possible to custom design artificial joints. Another medical development involves ultrasound. Originally used to detect structural flaws in aircraft, this technology is now enhancing the treatment of fire-related injuries. Each year in America alone, over 2 million people suffer serious burns. 200,000 need hospitalization. Assessing whether a burn is second or third degree is crucial in determining proper treatment. Now, aeronautic research using ultrasound has been modified to make rapid, accurate assessments of burn thickness. This procedure enables doctors to distinguish between a second degree burn that can heal naturally and a third degree which requires surgical skin grafting. Once left to time and a doctor's eye and experience, burn assessment can now be highly accurate and instantaneous. These are just some of the benefits coming out of space and aeronautical research. With Europe recovering from floods in Germany, Austria and the Czech Republic, a new weather satellite was launched that could help predict weather extremes in the future. MSG-1 will make forecasting faster and more accurate and identify freak weather conditions much quicker. The freak conditions cause devastation in their path. Now current satellite technology allows forecasts for the next three days using images of the Earth taken every half an hour. MSG-1 will double that speed and relay back higher resolution pictures and 20 times more data for a more accurate weather service. There are already ice prediction models to give weather forecasts for the motorways on ice or snow. At sea, we have marine forecasts for shipping and for the oil rigs, whether there are going to be gales or storms at sea or whether there's going to be fog, while in the air, there are also weather forecasts for aviation customers. The new satellite launched will orbit the Earth and scan images from its surface, gauging information on moisture, cloud buildup, and ozone concentration. 
It is added to information gathered from ground stations across the globe, providing a much more accurate understanding of weather. Experts say it will help if extreme conditions are on the horizon. There are many other potential users of space observations, civil security, people who use space observations for hazards, catastrophes predictions, and also for the rescue operations after flooding or fires. The UK has provided £120 million for the MSG project. Over the next 10 years, two more satellites will be launched, allowing scientists and meteorologists to study changing weather patterns far quicker and more accurately than they've ever done before. This medical device represents a dramatic step forward in the treatment of diabetes. It's called PIMS, Programmable Implantable Medication System. All this sophisticated hardware fits together in a titanium shell to form a computer, pump and reservoir. Invented by Robert Fischel, PIMS runs on one millionth the power of a flashlight bulb and some of its technology was borrowed from a pair of Viking spacecraft that landed on Mars in the mid-1970s. It's inserted just below the skin in the abdomen and can be refilled with insulin every two to three months. The first recipient of PIMS was Jack Petru, a professor at America's University School of International Service in Washington, D.C. For 28 years, Jack has had diabetes, and like many other people around the world, he coped with his body's inability to break down sugars through daily insulin injections. Jack's daily routine includes some tasks common to us all and some not so common. He must do a blood sugar test before and after all meals and activities. The reading helps determine how much insulin he needs after considering what he will eat for breakfast. With this handheld unit, information is relayed to the pump's computer, regulating the flow of insulin. Once an appropriate dose is entered, a start command is given. The two units communicate with each other using telemetry, the same way satellites beam information from outer space. The key to maintaining the correct blood sugar is through a combination of diet, insulin and exercise. Jack plays tennis regularly. He says PIMS has allowed him a general upgrading of his health. He feels better and in many ways it has given him a new lease of life. PIMS, the programmable implantable medication system, is another example of using space technology to improve our daily lives. the fourth planet from the Sun, and quite likely the first planet on which human explorers will one day land. Spacecraft have surveyed its immense canyons and towering volcanoes. Landers have photographed pink skies and a desert filled with boulders. Like Earth, Mars has seasons that turn summers into winters. Raging dust storms sometimes sweep over the planet, blocking its surface from view. While past missions to Mars have enhanced our knowledge of the planet, discoveries have led to important new questions. To answer some of these questions, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory established a mission in 1992 to map the Martian environment. Unlike Earth, 
Mars lost most of its atmosphere long ago. It grew cold and dry. So cold that some of its thin carbon dioxide atmosphere froze at the winter pole. In the same way that Earth orbiting satellites map the globe from pole to pole, so too would the Mars Observer Satellite map our neighbours. The primary goals of the mission were to understand the chemical and mineral nature of the surface, to measure the surface topography, and to create a relief map of the entire planet. The satellite would also study the gravity field and search for a magnetic field. Mars Observer offered scientists a basic global understanding of the planet for future exploration. The plan was that in August 1993, after 333 days in space, the craft would reach Mars and enter an elliptical orbit around the planet. The flight path would then be carefully adjusted over a period of four months until Mars Observer was in a circular orbit around the poles. At that point, all scientific instruments were to be fully deployed and made operational. Seven science experiments were to spend an entire Martian year about 687 Earth days exploring the planet on a global scale. Acting as a remote weather station, Mars Observer was to report on the planet's thin atmosphere and changing climate. Volcanoes and other landforms were to be studied to determine the geological processes that had shaped the surface of Mars. A search was to be conducted for evidence of a magnetic field Scientists wanted to know if water once flowed on its surface as earlier mariner and Viking missions had suggested. And if that was the case, where had the water gone? Were conditions for life on Mars more favourable in the distant past? It was clear that the data to be provided by the Mars Observer mission would help us understand the evolution of our planetary neighbours and provide a legacy for human exploration. At Kitty Hawk in 1903, the success of the Wright brothers put America at the leading edge of aviation. While the Europeans pulled ahead during World War I, that edge was recaptured and maintained by the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. For 75 years, the NACA NASA team has continued to fulfill this mission, to supervise and direct the scientific study of problems and solutions of flight both inside and outside the cockpit. Dramatic advancements have been made in reducing drag and increasing speed. For instance, in 1947, while piloting the X-1, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier for the first time. And the X-5 proved that the variable sweep wing could fly. The X-15, tested from 1958 to 1968, was the first aircraft to fly 67 miles high along the fringes of space. Reaching 4,500 miles per hour, it came back to an aerodynamically controlled landing. Inside the cockpit, control panels, once a myriad of dials, are being consolidated into easy-to-read monitors, enabling pilots to fly better and safer. Also helping the pilot are flight simulations. For a while, the only way to get the feel of an aircraft was to fly it. Flight simulators show how an aircraft will perform without leaving the ground. Together with wind tunnel testing and computational fluid dynamics, engineers and pilots have the best information possible before actual flight tests begin. 
Aeronautical improvements like these led NASA to a blending of air and space. One example is the lifting body concept. Half spacecraft, half aircraft, the lifting body achieves aerodynamic lift from the shape of its body alone. Lifting bodies were developed into NASA's successful Space Shuttle. Move over NASA, it's time for the Ban Bang Phai Rocket Festival in Northeast Thailand. More than 20,000 people turned out for the year's celebrations in Yasathorn province. The festival begins with a colourful parade down the main street, with local residents showing off some of the more beautiful rocket creations. Made from bamboo poles, plastic cylinders and enough gunpowder to blow up a small village, the rockets are carried across a muddy field one by one and raised onto tall bamboo launch pads. Most of the large rockets measure 2.5 meters long and contain about 7 kilograms of gunpowder. Teams come from all over the region to enter their rockets in the competition. The winning rocket is the one that stays up in the sky for the longest amount of time. The team takes home a trophy and thousands of baht in prize money. The event is held at the beginning of the rice growing season and is also known as the Rainmaking Festival. Locals believe their homemade rockets awaken the god of rain and that if he is pleased with the display, he will take care of their crops over the coming months. But what goes up must come down and there have been serious concerns raised over the safety of this festival. In previous years, spectators have been hit by debris from the rockets. And in 1999, five people were killed and 11 injured after a rocket accidentally exploded. Some rockets never quite make it off the launch pad. It's a tradition for the losing teams to have their rockets and sometimes themselves thrown into the mud. And there were no exceptions this year. For thousands of years, coffins have supplied the final resting place for humans. Their days, however, may be counted as alternative, innovative ways of dealing with the dead may become available. The ultimate eccentricity comes in the form of deep space burials which according to a US firm that took the first human ashes to the moon will become as easy to arrange in Europe as terrestrial cremations. At a funeral trade exhibition in Paris, funeral homes offered enhanced cremation services, which include molding the ashes of the dead into statues or even pendants that would allow the living to keep a memento of their loved ones close at hand. Celestis, a Houston-based firm that has sent the cremated remains of some 150 people into space, plans to make its unique service available on Europe's high streets through local funeral parlours and is beginning its campaign in Paris. Celestis, which promises loved ones will have the ride of their dreams, offers three alternative burials. A small portion of the ashes of the deceased are placed in a lipstick-sized plastic flight capsule to either orbit Earth before vaporizing and blazing like a shooting star in final tribute, or be buried on the moon or launched into deep space. Celestis, which made its first launch in 1997 and is still unprofitable, hopes that as satellite launches increase, it will be able to send more people's ashes into space.